Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 8, Halacha 1, in the Arch Scroll. We're on 71A1. This is part 4 of the Shear. This is the final part of the Shear, the conclusion of Chapter 8, Halacha 1. How did we get to this long Shear? Well, the idea is from the passage in Devarim 22.9, which says, HaKerem lo tizreya karamecha kilayim. Now, the, the first part of the shear started off, it says in Devarim 22.9, it says, You shall not sow your vineyard kilayim. And it points out that there's an extra word kilayim. It's really going to have two things in this sentence. It says, you shall not sow. That's going to be the tizreya, that you shall not sow. That's going to be one avoda. That's one work. And what's the second one? The second one is this extra mention of the word kalayim at the end of this. So in this pasuk, we have in here two laws that we learn that we're getting out from the first part of the shear in chapter 8, Halacha 1, which is that the extra use of the word kalayim here is used to teach that you're not allowed to maintain kalayim. And by the way, this extra word kalayim comes up when you look at the other verse uh, that talks about where we're deriving this for uh, regular seeds. So for kalei hakerim, there's the extra word uh, Kalayim, and where we're deriving this for Kalei Zerayim, there's also going to be in the Pasuk an extra word Zerayim, or Kalayim. And what is that extra word going to be? Well, I mean, we have Tazria over here, uh, Tizria, which is going to be to sow, that's one work, and Kalayim, that's going to be maintenance. In other words, that you can't sow it in a state of being in Kalayim. And secondly, if you did sow something in a state of being Kalayim, you're not allowed to maintain it. Those are going to be two different works. And in in chapter 8, Halaha 1, part 3 of the Shear, we were dealing with laws of Shvias and what do you do with uh, this prohibition where you have plowing, I'm sorry, uh, with sowing and pruning. And the Torah talks about sowing and pruning for Shvias. So I want you to realize that these two things are actually very, very connected. The Gemara is not going on a tangent saying, oh, gee, isn't this interesting that the laws of Shvias also have two things and the laws of Kalayim also have two things in the Pasuk. And what we've been doing in chapter 8, Halaha uh, 1, part 2 of this year, was going over this back and forth between Rabbi Yohanan and Rabbi Eliezer about what do you do where you have... Uh, Two verses, you have two works in a single verse, like sowing and pruning. So is that going to be a heckish, like the classic case of the donkey that we see in Shulcha Saveda, that, oh, you shall return a lost donkey to your friend or neighbor or fellow Jew, and that's going to be extrapolated out for other kinds of things? Or is it going to be where... You know, it's just those two works. Just those two things are going to be the issue. Now, it turns out that in this maloket, in this back and forth, Rabbi Lazar holds the, uh, the, the opinion that is going to be refuted, but he's going to be holding the opinion that that can be a heckish. It's unusual that these two things are put into a sentence, but that can be a heckish to apply to all other kinds of agricultural work. Now, that would be important because for us here with Kalayim, we have also a verse that has two works in it. We have sowing and Kalayim, where it's going to be used with this extra term Kalayim to be a thing of maintenance. So again, really you have in here, you're not allowed to maintain it. You're not allowed to sow it for Kalayim. So is that going to be a heckish like what Rabbi Lazar said, where, oh, you can extrapolate that out to all other kinds of prohibited labor? Or is it going to be like what Rabbi Yochanan says, and that's going to be the correct reading of it, where it says, no, it's just those two acts. 
And it turns out when you get to plowing, because plowing we saw in chapter 8, Halakha 1, part 2 of this year, plowing comes up because it's this like very hard to define uh, activity. What did you do when you plow? What exactly did you do? Did you bury something with earth so now you're maintaining? Did you actually sow when you covered something with earth with seed? When you're plowing, what did you do? Did you break up the ground so that it's going to be easy to sow in the future? Uh, did you plow just to get water into the root system, uh, but you actually didn't do anything with seed? Uh, so really, it's just kind of like a maintenance thing or it's something to improve growth. What exactly did you do? And the way that Rabbi Yochanan is going to be saying about plowing, he's going to be proving in chapter 8, Halacha 1, part 3 of this year, they're going to, going to be saying that, look, in the sentence about Shvius, how do we know that plowing is going to be a forbidden agricultural labor, even though it's not specifically mentioned in the Torah? He's going to be saying that it's from the first part of the sentence that is going to forbid it. And you have in the structure of the sentence over there, you have a, uh, a positive statement and then you have a neg and two negative statements of what you shall not do. So you have a uh, where it's saying, you know, your, your field you shall not sow and your vineyard you shall not prune. That's going to be the two works that are going to be negative. But the first part of the statement is going to be positive. It says six years you will sow your field and six years will, you will prune your vineyard. And so uh, that's going to be saying that you can do agricultural work and labor in the six years. But if it's the seventh year, well, that doesn't fall within that permit for plowing. So that's how he's going to be proving it. Uh, and then he's going to be saying that if you did these two specific acts during the seventh year that are specifically mentioned in the Torah, that's going to be uh, sowing the vineyard and pruning. Well, you're going to get two sets of makot for that, because for that, that's going to be two agricultural works. Now, we're going to get back into the rest of the conversation, because Actually, we're going to try to understand what are these two statements even mean? In other words, where you're saying that you shall not prune and you shall not sow. Uh, okay, that's two statements. And okay, fine. Rabbi Yochanan was saying that we're supposed to understand this in terms of being two specific agricultural labors. And it's just these two. It's not a heckish for all other agricultural labors. It's specifically these two. Now, we're going to get into why this is actually relevant. And that's going to come up because, um, you know, it's interesting because one of them was sowing is going to be something for grain. And what is pruning? Pruning is something for trees. So what do we see? Why is the Torah specifying just these two? Why didn't it just make a heckish to say, oh, you shall not sow? Well, because if you didn't say, oh, and also pruning, you might have said, well, sowing is just for grain. It's not for trees. So I can do work for grain issues, or I'm sorry, I can't do work for grain issues during the seventh year, but I can do work for tree issues during the seventh year. And we know that that's not correct. So the Torah has to make these two specific things. But again, it's pulling in two things that are related, one, to grain, and two, to trees. That's why this is in here. And now, when we're going to relate this back, even though it's unstated in the rest of this year, because again, you know, where did we start the shear from? We started from uh, maintenance and uh, sowing, because that's going to be the two verses that are in the Torah for Kaliam. And so over here, we're going to be saying that, oh, if you were doing these two things like sowing and also maintaining, how many sets of lashes are you going to get? Well, you're going to be getting perhaps two. If Now, there's a caveat on that. What's going to be maintenance? That's going to be where you knew that you had a legal kalayim and you dafka decided in your head you wanted to keep it. It's not going to be a passive thing that, oh, you know, uh, you know, it, it just sort of happened and the wind sort of blew this way and you didn't know about it. And, you know, it's sort of accidental kalayim. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about intentional kalayim with intentional maintenance. And if you were intentionally sowing, that's going to be one set of lashes. And if you were intentionally um, maintaining Kalayim, that's going to be another set of lashes. Now, if we only put in one of these and set it as a heckish, 
you wouldn't be able to derive maintenance from it. You'd say, oh, it says don't sow calliam. That means that I can't go ahead and do other agricultural works, like say putting, um, you know, two things within the work area or even covering it. I can't do any of these sorts of things that we've been learning about. And okay, well, that's going to be calliam. And why is maintenance going to be there? Well, because without the specif uh, specifying that maintenance is going to be a problem, you might have said that, oh, you can maintain calliam, just don't make calliam in the field. And so very much the Shvius connection and the Kalayim connection and how this is derived, because again, the Torah itself derives these two works together. In the case of Shvius, it's going to be the two works that's going to be sowing and pruning. One is going to be relating to grain and trees. And without two mentions there, you wouldn't know one from the other. You couldn't prove one from the other. And so too over here with Kalayim, there's two mentions. One is going to be sowing, and the extra use of the word Kalayim is going to be maintenance. And without one mention and also the other mention, you wouldn't be able to derive one without the other. And th that is why we care about all of this. Now, when we left off chapter 8, Halaha 1, part 3 of the Shear, we were talking about this back and forth between Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Yochanan about what do we do with the positive part of a statement. And by the way, the rest of this year is going to be covering uh, the, the issues with Shvius. But again, it's not out of context because the way this is derived for Shvius, the same logic is also uh, being used for the two mentions of the negative. You know, you shall not sow Kalayim, the extra use of Kalayim. So again, you have two mentions over here for Shvius. You have two mentions over here for Kalayim, and they're both going to be uh, negative acts. Lo say you shall not do. So uh, in in the end of the last year, we see, okay, there's these two negative commandments, and it starts with a positive commandment. And Rabbi Lazar, again, why are we talking about this? Because if it's going to be read like Rabbi Lazar with these two statements, and you're going to read it like a heckish. And why have we gone through, you know, four shears to look at this? Because if you're going to read this like a heckish, then what happens is that you'd say, oh, there's only one set of lashes for doing this. And, um, you know, all these other kinds of agricultural labors are going to be forbidden, but there's only one set of penalty for it. And you wouldn't know that really you're supposed to be getting, um, you know, two sets of mako not one set of makot. Why? Why? Because, again, Rabbi Yochanan is going to be saying that, no, the, the two specific things here are going to be two specific prohibitions. It's not a heckish at all. And when you have two prohibitions and you do both of them, you get, you're get you going to get two sets of lashes. And, again, it's going to be, you know, if you did this, did you get, and do you get, like, one set of penalty or did you get two sets of penalty? And that's important information to know. And uh, the, the Brisa that we read at the end was contradicting the opinion of Rabbi Lazar and challenging Rabbi Lazar's opinion that when you have these two negative statements, this is not read as a heckish, which, by the way, if somebody did one of these or another related thing, that, you know, it would be like one set of lashes. Rabbi uh, Yochanan's point is to say, well, if you did these two things, you're going to get two sets of lashes. And if you did something that's related, that's not going to be um, sewing, it's not going to be maintenance, but it's going to be problematic with climb, are you going to get lashes? You're not going to get lashes. So that's, that's going to be, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the subsets here. So that if you did one act, you might be getting one set of lashes. If you did two acts, uh, you might be getting two. If you did one, you did it in a certain way, where you are both maintaining and also sowing, like perhaps plowing, perhaps you're going to be getting, uh, you know, two sets of lashes. And and in some cases, according to what Rabbi Yochanan is pointing out, because it's not a heckish, you're not going to get any lashes, depending on uh, what agricultural activity you did, that's not going to be sowing or uh, maintaining. So very, very different in how you're determining punishment 
uh, based on whether it's going to be Rabbi Lazar and what do you do with these two statements if it's heckish, or it's going to be like Rabbi Yochanan where it's, no, it's just these two. And so we're bringing another Baraisa that's going to reinforce um, from uh, Rabbi Lazar that it's not going to be Rabbi Lazar's view of a heckish. It's going to be more like Rabbi Yochanan's view where it's just these two. So when we looked at the last Baraisa where it, it's going on offerings and it's using the term over in Devarim 1213 and saying, beware uh, for yourself, uh, lest you offer up your Ola offerings in any place that you see fit. And that is going to, by the way, be a lota say. That's a negative commandment. That's going to prohibit sacrificial offerings from coming on the altar outside of the temple. And then you have the next part, okay? So the next part is going to be uh, this negative commandment that we get from uh exegesis and how do we determine the reading of this with the logic of the Torah and it says it's written there in the temple you shall offer up your Ola offerings and there you shall do all that I command you so uh, this by the way is in the rest of the verse in 1214 so again by juxtaposing the positive statement of there you shall offer up and there you shall do in a single verse the Torah is teaching through the principle of a heckish, that the laws are analogous. So that would be a heckish, and that's going to be a single uh, command. So just as offering up outside of the temple is prohibited by a negative commandment, where it's going to say, beware for yourself, Marfold is going to be pointing out that in addition to the positive one, so too, slaughtering outside is going to be prohibited by a negative commandment in addition to the positive one. So the Gemara is going to look at uh, how this Baraisa is going to be uh, to be read. And the Gemara says, because it is written where it says the verse is there you shall offer up and there you shall do, this is going to be expounded in a scriptural analogy. A scriptural analogy is going to be one of the tools that we use to understand uh, how the Torah is to be read and understood in Jewish law. And the Gemara is saying, if, however, the verses are teaching an analogy uh, that are not written, then slaughtering would be limited to a positive commandment. So if this is going to be saying, uh, basically, like if the Torah would have omitted the positive commandment in here where it says, you know, there you shall offer up, um, you know, that would negate this scriptural analogy. In other words, you'd be changing the logic of it. So the question is, According to Rabbi Lazar, you know, slaughtering should be prohibited with a negative commandment, even without the analogy, since it is part of a general category um, that was singled out through a negative commandment. But again, you know, this seems to contradict the view of Rabbi Lazar. And, you know, because the Torah is teaching a scriptural analogy between this and that. So the Gemara is going to, you know, look at uh you know, why the Torah chooses to teach this analogy and what's the reason. And the Gemara says, so that one will not say regarding offering and slaughtering a rule that's going to be akin to that which is said in Shabbos regarding, you know, Shabbos, if somebody dug a hole, made a furrow, or thrust an object into the ground during a single lapse of awareness, then he's liable to only one set of chatas offerings since all of these acts fall into a category of a single primary malaha. What's that going to be? Plowing. Plowing, by the way, comes up a lot. Plowing is like this issue of what do you do with Shabbat? What do you do over in terms of Shvias? And what do you do in terms of Kalayim? So the, the Pnei Moshe says about this, since all of these acts share a single purpose, that's going to be to soften the ground, they're all forms of plowing with regards to Shabbos. So therefore, if somebody made all three in a single moment of unawareness, then you're liable to only one chatas um, because he only did a single malacha. And the chatas, by the way, is going to be for an inadvertent uh, transgression. We're not talking about uh, if you're doing it like, um, like on purpose, that's going to be another issue. So um, the Gemara is going to say, similarly, one might say uh, regarding an offering brought outside the temple, that if someone slaughtered the animal, that's going to be one 
act through the blood, that's the second act, and offered up the sacrifice in the single lapse of awareness, that would be the third act, that he should be liable for only one hatas uh, for these acts are part of a single sacrificial service, and that would fall under a single prohibition. Because of this possibility, the Gemara says, the Torah was compelled to say the scriptural analogy to teach a separate negative commandment for each sacrificial service. In other words, the Gemara is pointing out that why is this written here? So that if somebody slaughters, that's one, throws the blood, that's two, and then offers the sacrifice in a single lapse of awareness, how many makot is he liable for? Gemara says he's liable for separate chatas for each and every one of these acts. Sorry, not makot, it would be chatas. So the idea is that if the Torah left out the verse where it says, there you shall offer up, and uh, left it with this principle where we were learning uh, before that, uh, you know, we could, you know, we could learn um, that the different avodas uh, really could be, could really just be, oh, it's like one thing, right? So again, this comes back to a case of, oh, well, maybe this is really just like a heckish. And maybe it's like a heckish because you're doing uh, general activities that are related to it. And, you know, the scripture is saying, if you were going to word it that way, like, oh, and you're going to read it that way, that, oh, there should just be one set of uh, malaha here, because what did you do, right? And, and without... Uh, the scriptural analogy, uh, there'd be no source to penalize each of these acts individually. So why? Because you would say that it's a heckish, it's for slaughter, right? This is to be read as, oh, these multiple acts here are really just like a single act. Why? Because you were just slaughtering and it's just a single offering. And because it's a single offering, and yes, you're doing many acts on a single offering, um, and you're going to read this like a heckish, then, okay, how many, how many, you know, malachas did I do? I only did one. And there'd be no way to infer that you, you really did three. And that's really a deep point here because this is, this is actually the same thing with uh, the verse that we're looking at where it says, you shall not sow your vineyard and you shall not prune. That's going to be for Shvias. Or for Kaliam, where it says, your vineyard, you shall not sow Kaliam. That is going to have two acts there. Both of them are going to have two acts there. So if you did both of these things, either in Shvias or for Kalayim, you get two sets of Makot. You did two transgressions. And if you are going to read it like Rabbi Lazar's, there's no way to get to two Makot. You can only get one set of Makot. And the same, why is this bringing this in here with the offering? Because this is not to be read as a heckish where you're having many, many acts and you say, oh, this many acts is related to only to one offering, therefore you only get one set of punishment, you, you're you not to be reading it that way. You're supposed to be reading it where you're violating each and every one of the acts that's mentioned in the verse, and because you met, you violated each and every one, you're not getting one set of chatas or punishment, you're getting three sets because you violated each one of the three sets. And if you read it by Rabbi Lazar, you'd say, and you're going to say these things are really, these three things are really one thing, then you're going to say, well, I only get one punishment. But that's not the halakha, and that's not the oral law, and that's not the tradition. The tradition is three sets, not one set. And the same too here for Kalayim, if you did the act of sowing and then dafka, the act of maintenance, how many did you do? You didn't do one thing. And if it was to be read as a heckish, You'd say one thing, no, it's going to be two set of makot. You did two things wrong. This very much gets back to a similar kind of thing that comes up in the shas, where it's talking about, you know, if somebody ate a bee, how many makot uh, did they get? How many violations did they get? And if they ate an ant, how many violations did they do? And again, we saw this in the first part of, of the shear in the earlier parts of this year with Makot in the Mishnah, where it's saying that somebody can plow a field and they can do eight malahot 
within it. They can be liable to, you know, eight violations of the Torah. And this is very much uh, like what's going on over here. So uh, you can end up with getting multiple violations. That's why this is in here to refute the reading of Rabbi Lazar. Now, the Gemara is looking at this law where it's, it's looking at these different acts that are specifically mentioned in the Torah that, that, you know, that we just mentioned that fall under a single Shabbos prohibition. And in Shabbos, it's going to be a little bit different than in terms of the offering or the agricultural laws, because uh, over in Shabbos, you have, you have primary labors and then you have subsets of labors. And there's a very good conversation about what do you do with all this in Shabbos in the Yerushalmi 7-1 with a back and forth between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer. It's actually the first time Rabbi Akiva challenged Rabbi Eliezer in public. And the, the whole text uh, is very well preserved there, um, actually better than the Bavli does it. And I encourage you to go look at it. It's the end of uh, 7-1 in Shabbos Yerushalmi. And the very same sets of conversation come up, like, oh, if somebody is going and making specific violations on Shabbos and they're doing, say, three sets of labor, how many how many chatases do they have to bring? And Rabbi Lazar is going to be saying that you you only you're going to do three, and Rabbi Akiva is going to be saying one. So that conversation and the logic behind it's over there, but over here we're going to get back to. Uh, relating back to the agricultural work, Rabbi Zera says in the name of this, in this Gemara, the name of Rabbi Chia Bar-Ashi, who says in the name of Kana, uh, one who plants a tree on Shabbos is liable for transgressing the malacha of sowing. That's going to be one of the 39 malachot. And since plowing and sowing fall under the same primary malacha, one uh, who performs both acts in a single lapse of awareness is liable to only one, uh, one chatas. In other words, um, planting, uh, this is going to be performed for trees. And sowing, zorea, this is going to be performed for grain and seeds. Now, Mara Fulda points out that both acts are prohibited under the primary malaha of sowing. So somebody who's performing both in a single abs lapse of awareness, he should only bring one chatas offering. So again, you're doing agricultural works that fall in this like one general category. So how many are you going to get? And the Gemara says that Rabbi Zera said pruning trees is like planting trees. And in other words, one who is both pruning and planting the single lapse of awareness should only be liable to one uh, hatas. Now, Mara Fulda says that basically says the same thing that Rashi says about this in chapter seven, Halacha two in the Babli, uh, in the Sekha Shabbos, that pruning promotes the growth of a tree or a vine and is therefore prohibited as a form of planting. So if somebody is both pruning and planting, says Amara Fulda, and they do that on Shabbat in a single lapse of awareness, he's liable to only one hatas. And the Gemara now is going to assume that Rabbi Zera and Rabbi Kana are having a maloka. In fact, they're not. They're talking about different nuances of the law. So the Gemara says regarding one who planted and pruned trees during Shvias and did that in a single lapse of awareness, according to the view of Kana, he's liable to two sets of lashes. Again, you transgressed what? It says, your field you shall not sow. That's what the Torah says. What did you do for the second thing? Well, you violated what the second negative prohibition of the Torah, which says, uh, the vineyard you shall not prune. That's two things. So Rabbi Kanievsky says about this, according to Kana, planting is a, fo a form of sowing, and it is therefore forbidden during Shvias under the prohibition of your field you shall not sow. Now, regarding pruning during Shvias, it's explicitly prohibited by the verse, where the verse in the Torah itself says your vineyard you shall not prune. And since these acts are prohibited under separate commandments, somebody who performs both in a single lapse of awareness is going to be liable to two sets of lashes. And that, by the way, is very much the opinion of what Rabbi Yochanan says. Rabbi Yochanan says that you'd be getting two. Why? Because the Torah specifically mentions these two labors. And you did 
one and one, that's going to be two violations. And it's not to be read like a heckish where you did, uh, you did these um, uh, two labors and to say like, oh, it's like a heckish and you should only be liable to one. Now it looks like, wait a second, but maybe Rabbi Zera is saying maybe maybe it's like Rabbi Lazar and maybe maybe it is like a heckish, but that's really not what Rabbi Zera is pointing out. Rabbi Zera is talking about something with the laws of Shabbos. That's a little bit different. So the Gemara says, according to the view of Rabbi Zera, he's liable to only one set of lashes. So what would that be? Well, it says, your field you shall not prune. Now, in Rabbi Zera's view, Planting is akin to pruning and not sowing. So it would seem that a person who transgressed uh, both um, is, only, is only violating pruning, not sowing. So he should be liable to one set of lashes. So the Gemara is, gonna, is actually going to clear this up very quickly to say, no, wait a second. Rabbi Zara and Rabbi Kana don't have two different views here. And Rabbi Zera is not saying it's like Rabbi Lazar, where, you know, it's saying like it's like a heckish and should only be related to one thing. So the Gemara is going to solve what Rabbi Zera is really meaning here. The Gemara says, did not Rabbi Zera state simply that pruning is like planting? And, you know, did he perhaps say that planting is, is like pruning? And so, you know, there's... The, really, Rabbi Lazar is agreeing that planting a tree is a form of sowing. And what he's doing by, because he switched the order of the words, and he's merely adding that pruning is forbidden under this prohibition because it's a form of planting. And that's going to be included in the category of sowing. So Mara Fulda clarifies it like this, that had Rabbi Zara said that planting is a form of sowing, Okay, then a statement would be a dispute with Rabbi Kana, and it would be very much like what Rabbi Lazar is saying. But he didn't say that. He he said that he said that um, uh, he said that that planting uh, is like you know he didn't say planting is like pruning. Uh, he said pruning is like planting. And so, what does that mean? Pruning is like planting. Well, that means that. It's like sowing. So the Gemara is, is, is pointing out that uh, he was very careful about the word order to make sure that, oh, uh, if you did this, uh, you did two things. You did sowing and you also did pruning. And he did not say that planting is like pruning because if he did say that, that would be saying like, oh, you only get one set of lashes. And uh, the Gemara is going to say that everything that promotes growth, like pruning, planting, and grafting, was included in the category of sowing on Shvius. And that is why the Torah taught a separate prohibition against pruning on Shvius for your vineyard you shall not prune. And that is because pruning was singled out for stringency. And that's to be prohibited with its own individual prohibition in addition to the prohibition against sowing. Now, why do you have one mention of something that's related to trees here? Because again, we have sowing, which normally is going to be related to grain, and we have pruning, which is normally going to be related to trees. And, you know, we also have, you know, odd things with regards to climb as well, because uh, you know, the vine, the grapevine is going to be treated like a tree. And uh, also you can have maintenance issues there with the grapevines. And you can also have maintenance issues with regards to vegetables or other things that you sow like grain. And so you have, uh, you have two mentions over here in Kalayim. And you have two mentions over here in Shvius. And in Shvius, you have where it says, um, you know, these two things. One is related uh, to uh, agricultural act related to grain, and one is for orchards. And in fact, the organization of Masechet Shvius is chapter one is going to be about orchards, and chapter two is going to be about grain. And so it's driving home this argument that actually both acts are going to be specifically mentioned. You get two sets of makot for this, 
and it's covering both kinds of things on the seventh year. And the Gemara says, and it drives home this argument, it says because pruning was stringle, singled out for stringency, um, you know, you wish to exempt one who prunes and plants during Shvias for liability for sowing. So in other words, that's asking a question. And the Gemara concludes and says it's established that there's no difference between the views of these two Amarim at all, whether according to the view of Rabbi Kana or whether the view according to Rabbi Zera, the Gemara concludes and says one who plants and prunes during Shvias is liable to two sets of lashes, one for the prohibition of your field you shall not sow, and the other prohibition for your field you shall not prune. Now, what happened with regards to Shabbos? Well, the laws of Shabbos are a little bit different. That's dealing with uh, acts of uh, awareness and also dealing with uh, these chains of uh, families of work within the Malaha and what happens if you did from the same sets of chains of Malaha like uh, different acts of uh, agricultural works within the subset of sowing well how many violations did you do so that's going to be uh, in a single act of lapse of awareness, that's going to be one one chatas. And over here, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. If you did uh, these two agricultural acts, like sowing and pruning, what did you do? You did two violations. So a little bit different here in the way it works. And also, it's going to be connected very much with the Kalayim issue of, oh, if you were sowing, which is mentioned in the Torah, and also you were maintaining, that's the extra use of the word kalayim there, what did you do? You also did two violations and you get two sets of makot. And that is why uh, this all has been in here with regards to the mystery of why plowing has been talked about and dealing with, you know, half of the shear related to Maseka Shvias, because again, uh, how are we reading these verses? Again, over here, in Shvias, there's two sets of acts that are specifically mentioned. And over here in Kalayim, there's two sets of acts that are specifically mentioned. And as Rabbi Yochanan says, that we have to look at each one of these two acts as a forbidden labor. And violating each one of those, or any one of those, is liable to its own set of lashes. And it's not to be read as a heckish for all general agricultural acts like what Rabbi Lazar was proposing, but rather that uh, it's going to be just these specific ones. And there's a lot going on here with uh, hermeneutics and also with you know the, the statements of how do we read the Torah that we say every morning from the 13 statements and how do we understand it. And when we get to Halakha 2, uh, we're going to be dealing with animals and you know, there's also prohibitions with animals, like you're not allowed to uh, lead two animals together, like a donkey and an ox. And that's very much connected with what we've been learning today. Have a great day. And by the way, the past four Shireem, I think, are really important to understand some of the hermeneutical principles and how Torah law is constructed. Have a great day.